use the greatest weapon that God ever gave you, which is your tongue, and start doing battle. Now, if you're like I was before you got saved, you're used to using it anyway. You slice and dice people with your tongue all the time. I used to cuss like a sailor. I mean, I was just, just horrible. I cussed because it felt good. I'd wake up cussing, you know. But the minute I got saved, I got a new nature. And all that left me. And then I started speaking blessings. And I used to have to wear eyeglasses to drive uh -huh, and to read. And then I found out that Jesus was the healer for today. I found out scriptures like Isaiah 53, 5. By his stripes we are healed. And that I needed to start calling those things that are not as though they were. Romans 4, 17. I was not seeing very well. But I wanted to see well. So I began to confess what God's word said about my eye situation. Even though in the natural, forget it. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. But I began to say what the Word says about me. And after five long years, I got pulled over by a policeman for having a tail light out. And he saw on my driver's license, I was supposed to have my glasses on, that I had long since thrown away because my eyes had gotten better. But I didn't go get a change for whatever reason, it's just stupid. And I told him, I said, my eyes are actually better. He says, well, if you'll go to the driver's testing center and have them tested, we'll take that off the ticket. And so I went over to Sears in the mall and had my eyes tested. Passed all the tests, 2020 vision. Took me five years, but I got it. And they took it off my driver's license. Recently, I got a Florida driver's license. I passed the test faster this time than I did last time. And that was over 10, 15, 20 years ago. So it's, it's still stayed. It's lasted. But that's because I spoke words of quickening. And that's because my faith was allowed to go to a higher level. It took me time. While I'm simultaneously praying for other people to be healed of brain tumors that are living and not dying and the stuff's instantly disappearing, that's your anointing. That's for everybody else. I had to walk by faith. I didn't get a, a wand waved, waved over my head. I had to go by what I read and by what I said. Say that with me. I'm going to start to live by what I've read and by what I've said. I'm going to stop living Christianity out of my head. And I'm going to start living out of my spirit man. Out of my It'll make all the difference in the world. It'll make all the difference in the world. You didn't say that. That's good. No. Go, go back up for a second. Go back. This is the perfect leading. Did that answer your question? I didn't even tell you 1 John 3 and 8. Real quickly, look at this. 1 John 3 and 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So you would all agree that Jesus' sole purpose in the context of this scripture was to destroy the works of the devil. Would, would you say that's right? And in the context, he's talking about sin in particular. You see that? But now go over to Acts 10 and 38. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. How God, who anointed Jesus of Nazareth? God did. With the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So when Jesus goes about doing good, the Bible calls that, in part, healing people who were oppressed by the devil. Can you see that? Is that a stretch? God says one of the good things that Jesus did was to heal people oppressed by the devil. I mean, that's just clear as plain as day, right? You see that? Say, I see that. I see that. Everybody? I see that. Now, what did he say in 1 John 3 and 8? His purpose was to destroy 
the works of the devil. So if sickness ever one time came from God, he would not be calling it a work of the devil. Because right here, he's healing those who are oppressed. He says the reason they needed a healing is they were oppressed by the devil. You see that? And Jesus' purpose of his anointing, at least one part, was to heal and destroy those evil works. So the next time Pastor Disaster tries to tell you that God put sickness on you to teach you something, take him to 1 John 3 and 8 and Acts 10 and 38 and ask for an explanation. And they do it every Sunday in America. They do it every Sunday. Millions of Christians are taught that doctrine. And never once will they come to these scriptures and try to explain it to you. I'm going to say it again. God and the devil are not partners. They're not. They're not co-laborers. In the Garden of Eden, there was not one single sin. There was not one single sickness. Not one single lack. Until Adam and Eve sold out to the devil. If God had wanted sin disease or lack in the Garden of Eden, he'd have put it in there before the serpent and Eve got started talking. Just plain and simple. When they built this building, they paid a pretty penny to those contractors to come and build it right the first time. They didn't want them coming back to adjust beams that were leaning or rotten or tilted. I'm up here today because we're having our church spread in Florida with... Uh, the, we had honeybees. We took over an old VFW building that sat there for five years. I had honeybees and termites and other social bugs. And so we've paid not a, not a few dollars to have that stuff taken care of, but I'm not going to be in there while it's being sprayed, so I had the doors open to come here, so I'm here. And these pastors of this church are relaxing this month, and it just worked out well to come here. All right. I wanted to spray it. I want it done right the first time. I don't want to go back home and go... What's that bug on the wall there? You see? He had better do it right the first time. We're under contract. So why in the world, if God wanted you to ever be sick, ever suffer lack, or ever have a sin in your life, why didn't he put it in there before Adam and Eve fell? He doesn't. And why isn't there any in heaven? There isn't. And why did Jesus say in Matthew 6 and 10, when they asked him to teach his disciples to pray, why did he tell them, well, pray my will be done on earth as it is in heaven? If he wanted you to experience sin, sickness, or lack. Now, I'm not, I'm not debating whether people experience those things. I have experienced those things, and I know they're not of God. Okay, so I'm not bashing anybody. I, I have mercy on myself. Okay? For my own stupidity. Hosea 4 and 6 says, My people perish for a lack of knowledge. Not the world. He's not in covenant with them. He's under no obligation to, to, to chastise them. Their first act of chastisement, if they don't get right with Jesus, is they're going to burn in hell. Okay? You, on the other hand, who have a relationship with him, he does chastise you. He does correct you. But it's not the things that Jesus redeemed you from. Go to Timothy, and I'll show you exactly what he uses to correct you with. First, or excuse me, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, and verse 16. That when God chastises you, when you get in trouble with God, this is what this is how he spanks you. Let me come back up here. That, that light's about to set me on fire. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. I'm going to turn this on so I can see up here. All right. Second Timothy 3 and 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. How does the Bible say that God chastises you or corrects you? With the Word of God. You know what that means? That means, let's say, uh, you're stressing over the bills. You know worry is not right. I'm going to call this faith. Work is a sin. You know, you get on people who shack it up, but you work, you're a worry ward. <laughs> They're shacking up is just a, a fleshly, physical sin. Yours is of a deeper thing. Worry is a sin. Worry calls God a liar. So then some minister like myself says worry is a sin. And he quotes 1 Peter 5 and 7. Which says, cast the whole of your care over on the Lord. And the Amplified says, because he cares for you affectionately. And then conviction sets in. The Holy Ghost, the only one qualified to convict you, not your husband. Look straight ahead. Not your wife, your dog, or your cat. The only one qualified to convict you. We should say that right now out loud. I, I am, not am not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So, so, I am not, I am not qualified, qualified to convict anyone. To convict anyone. <laughs> That'll help us get along a whole lot better, won't it? Yeah. So when we quote the Word of God to you, the Holy Spirit is sitting on that word and it penetrates your heart and this ominousness comes upon you. It's like, it's like when my friend said, you should pray about being a pastor. You'd be a great pastor. You'd be firm, but you'd be fair. You'd be just like our pastor. Well, our pastor sits on Joyce Myers' board. we got a 2,000 member church. I don't want to hear all that. I don't want a pastor. I had a, I had a speech prepared for him, for anybody who would even remotely bring that up. I'm going evangelizing. Shoot me now <laughs> if I ever have to pastor. But as soon as he said it, April 16th, 2011, at IHOP. Why is it always an IHOP? A Waffle House or a Denny's? Stay out of those places if you don't want life-changing experiences with God. Do they have those things up here? No. Is, is, is it just, just like a thing, you know? We should find out who the owners of these businesses are and write them letters. What you put in the, in the food, dude? So he says, you know, this thing about pastoring, and I'm like, I was getting ready to give him my speech, and the worst Holy Spirit conviction came on me. It was like the day I got born again. You know that guy, Atlas, with the, with the world in his back? Oh, I felt like that guy's twin brother. And I remember thinking, I can't breathe. Oh, God. He put voodoo on me. I can't breathe. I can't, I can't, I can't even breathe to tell him I'll never do it. And I said to myself, self, you need to repent. And you need to, you need to just submit. Because that's the word of God. Dude. And it was horrible. I would have rather been spanked. Where's cancer when you need it? <laughs> Conviction was horrible. Horrible. And so it, here's how I responded. Fine. I'll do it. That was, that was my willing and obedience. Fine. I'll do it. And for two hours from Asheville, North Carolina to Knoxville, I suffered immensely. For two hours, I was in a Holy Ghost timeout. And I felt like I was getting slapped in the behind, knocked in the head. It was terrible. While my attitude got corrected. And never once did he put disease on me. Never once did he cause lack. In fact, the day that I said I would pastor, I just verbalized it with a pitiful attitude. My whole entire life began to change financially. My whole entire life began to change in mentally. My emotion, I mean, just every, yeah, I was like Jonah in the belly of a whale. I didn't want a pastor. I don't want to hear about pastoring. I've been all over the world telling people about Jesus. I've been to Tarsus, <laughs> and I stayed. 
And here's this bell in the well telling me I gotta go pastor. And he spit me out down in Clearwater, Florida, one month later. And life has never been the same. So I want to emphasize this to you tonight. God does not chastise you with anything that is evil. Your enemy, the devil, is trying to kill you with anything evil he can find. And you, who have a tremendous anointing or a gift, but not the character to support it, are trying to kill yourself with the good that God has for you. Oh, should I say that again? You, who have a tremendous anointing or a gift or a talent, but you don't have the character yet to hold it, are trying to kill yourself with the good thing that God called you to do. Oh, yeah. I served, I don't know who this is for, but I served in my home local church for 12 straight years in absolute obscurity. I never missed service more than one day in the course of a year. There were times I had to walk to church six miles because the vehicle was broke or whatever. I took the bus, got off in the back, hoping nobody would see me. Whatever it took to get there, I was there. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And I volunteered so much on these various ministry teams that they finally called me and said, stop volunteering for so much stuff. You're overextended. So I was there two and three other nights a week. I created a basketball league from scratch. It was just an open gym night. We had two goals on a concrete floor, and we had 50 guys from the hood coming in to play ball. One other person besides myself came to play basketball in our church's gym that actually went to our church. And from that open gym, we created two basketball leagues, a men's league and a women's league. And it took me another three or four extra days being at church to run that league for free on a volunteer basis. In addition to Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And never one time in my home church was I ever asked to preach from the pulpit. Ever. I was in the schools preaching and teaching to 500 kids a week before school started. I was glad they didn't ask me to preach up there. I had too much going on elsewhere. And plus, it would have stolen from me the opportunity to learn what goes on in the workings of a church. So that after 12 years, I began to get asked to go preach other places. People began to hear about me and what God was doing and saying in and through me. And so doors started opening all over the world. And so for the last two years I was at that church, I was gone a lot. And I would be preaching in my own service on a Sunday, feeling guilty because I wasn't back at my home church listening to my pastor. That's just crazy. But that's also probably when you're ready to be ushered out there, too. You're up there getting your service together, and you're like, man, I'm missing church. <laughs> yeah, you have to have a heart for God and his church. You can't be down on the things that he's up on. I, I get a kick out of these signs I see in Florida. For those who don't like church. So let me get this straight. You're going to start a church with a bunch of disgruntled church people and expect that the thing's going to be successful and they're not going to just AKA one another after about a month. Really? Whose idea was that? That's just crazy. Church is imperfect. You're, you're going to get hurt. Imperfect people hurt. That's what they do. They hurt one another. But it's not God. The building didn't do it unless it fell on you in a tornado or something. The, 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 yeah, the church is not a building. It's the people. So quit blaming church for why you're staying at home on Sunday morning. Why don't you just go to the person who hurts you and say something to them? Isn't that what the scripture says? If your brother offends you, go to him. Instead of just skipping out and hiding behind all that, you just tell the truth. You don't want to go to church anyway. You were glad to get hurt, so you'd stay at home. Your rebellious thing. And no, you don't got to go to church to go to heaven, but you got to go to church to be an obedient Christian. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Yeah. And it's not watching Joe Holstein on TV on Sunday mornings either. And, and I love his family, his dad, 
was the consummate New Testament pastor. And he would tell you too, you need to be in a home church. But you can't, you know, that's good in addition to. This is good in addition to. But this is not your own local church. Okay, this is an outreach service. This is a Holy Ghost service. All right? And it's on an off night. <laughs> okay? If there is such a thing. So, that's the answer to your question. God and the devil are not on the same team. But someone will say, Job, what about Job? Well, I'm glad you said. So, let's go to Job. Now we're going to eat some hamburgers. For the sacred cow we're about to annihilate. In Job chapter 1, God, who doesn't talk like you and I, called Job the greatest man in the East. Yet all the while, this man was in fear up to here. And the, and his, but his residue, before he got into fear, he had such a walk with God that the residue of his obedience was still like a mirage or an illusion to the devil who thought that there was still a hedge of protection up over him. That's how deceived and blind the devil is. Don't make this guy out to be bigger than God. In Ezekiel or in Isaiah, we're going to look on him and, and say, that's the dude? That guy right there is the one that deceived all these people? Don't make the devil bigger out than he is. You'd have to get on your face to get eye level with him. Because he's under your feet. As long as you talk that way. I, I, I get amused by Christians that bind the devil in the morning and loose God and the angels. And then they bind God and the angels at night and loose the devil. Yeah. With your words and your actions. Five o'clock is time to walk to the mailbox. Oh, God, Jesus. Oh, let there not be anything in there, you know. That's, that's fear, man. You just don't let the, the devil just walk you arm in arm to the mailbox. This is how you walk to the mailbox. Philippians 4.19, My God, he shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Psalm 37 and 1, I delight myself in the Lord and he gives me the desires of my heart. Psalm 23 and 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he, though he was rich, became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. I could go on and on. Deuteronomy 8.18. He hath given me the power to get wealth so that I may establish his covenant. That's how you go to the mailbox. And so what if something's in there? The scripture says don't be afraid of sudden fear. That's the easy one. It's that stuff that's slow in coming that's a little bit more of an issue. It's the stuff that's just kind of there. That sudden stuff, that's easy. That's, that's easy. The Bible says not, not to fear. But go to Job. And look right here. It says, he, his sons would go and feast in verse 4. And then on down, when their feastings had run their course, he would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now, this is the oldest book in the Bible, and we don't really know the covenant that Job had with God. But the Bible says in Proverbs that if you train your child up in the way that he should go, even when he's old, he won't depart from it. So Job should have known that had he trained his children right, they weren't cursing God in their heart during the day or the night. You see? But he didn't know. He said it may be that they have. I have a 20 year old. She's Jesus' twin sister. She's probably praying for me right now. I know she's raised right. We did it with the word. Yeah. I don't ever wonder about her. Ever. Never. Not once. Seriously, not once. Because we did what the covenant said. Job's over here sacrificing in fear when he should have been walking in faith. It sounds religious. Fear sounds religious. You better watch what you say. The devil's going to hear you. That's the very dude I want to hear me. When I wake up in the morning, I go looking for him. Why wait? We're, let's get it on now. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
I bind the devil. I rebuke him. I cast him out. I tread on him. I trample on him. I don't give him place in my life. I don't yoke up with him. I don't hang out with his brothers and sisters. Unless it's to convert them. And I do all that in the name of Jesus. He's not afraid of me, but he's afraid of the name. And if you know what's in the name, he knows you know what's in the name, and he's going to run. But if you don't know what's in the name, even if you call yourself a believer, he's going to say to you what the say he said to the seven sons of Sceva. Uh, Paul we know, and Jesus we know, but who be you? And we just did this a, just a few nights ago in Worthington. I just cast devils out of somebody just a few days ago. What? Yeah. And you're neck of the woods. I had two teenagers emailing me on Facebook about thoughts of suicide when I was coming up here. Not church kids. These are kids from out in the street. Okay? And they were going to this church. And I prayed with both of them uh, on the previous trip that I was up here. And so I was trying to set up a counseling session with them after service or the next day. I was going to stay over. And, uh, you know, you can get more done casting the devil out than you can counsel for four or five hours. Plus, it saves you a whole lot of money you spend on food and stuff. And so, in the service, I taught a message called Born for War. And I was talking about various spirits to try to afflict the people of God and what to do about it. And so we got off on a spirit of witchcraft and an unclean spirit and whatnot. You know, of course, we're stirring stuff up in the room. You know, anybody that came in with three or four, now they're all just freaking out, you know. And so we had asked people to come forward that want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, she got up and left. The very one wanting to be there, the very one wanting counsel, decided she couldn't stand it anymore, didn't want to be in there anymore, and left. And so he went out there. Now, he's this big old guy. He's got a teardrop under his eye. And if you know where you get those from, you don't get it from flipping pancakes. <laughs> okay? And uh, he's a tough old dude. looked like he could eat you. And he went out there and he got her and brought her back in. But then he came down front while we're praying for people to be Holy Ghost filled. And he says, Pastor, the girl that was with me, she's left. She don't want to be in here anymore. I got her. But now she's crawled up under the pew up against the wall screaming. Would you go pray for her? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been nice having service with you fine folks today. We've got to go. Cut it short. We'll see you later. You know. No, I said, sure, let's go pray for her. So we went back there, and she's up against the wall, her hands over her ears, and she's screaming. Now, the last time I was up in Iowa, not the last time, a couple of times before, I had the same thing happen in Iowa. This old gal, uh, Rolled up under the chairs on me, kissing at me like a cat. You ever try to give a cat a bath? It's not going to happen, is it? Well, that's what she was acting like. We cast the devil out of her, too. So this one was up there, and I said, so and so, it's Pastor Eric, give me your hand. And she just kind of shook like she came to when she heard my voice, and she stuck her hand up like, why am I doing this? And I grabbed her by the hand. I said, come on, let's go down front. She said, I don't, look kind of like playful, I don't want to go down front. Oh, come on, let's go down front, it'll be good. She says, I said, I don't want to go down front. <laughs> it started screaming at me. And then she pushed me in the chest. And I said, oh, I'm not that guy. No, no. That's, uh uh <laughs> Shut up, Satan, in the name of Jesus, and you come out of her right now. And went off in the name of Jesus. And she looked like, oh, <laughs> and passes out the floor as we're singing the blood songs and praying in the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit says, it's done, she's free. So I went on back down to the stage because I have people up here getting filled with the Holy Ghost. The devil can't have my service. It's just, that's just a part of it. So we get them filled, and then the boy's mom brings the girl down, and she's like in a daze. And I have her turn around and tell everybody Jesus is her Lord and rebuke the devil. She passed out again. And she sent me an email yesterday saying, I, I wish I could have got with you yesterday, but I didn't go to school until 4.30. Thank you for your help and all, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. These are the things that are going on in your community. You're not going to successfully navigate through that in your head. You're not going to mentally know the scriptures and successfully set a, ch a child free. Who you'll reread re re it out on the news the next day they've hung in from the garage somewhere. Now, you want to hide from that, go ahead. But you're not pleasing God. And Hebrews says that without faith it's impossible to please God. And so while you can't change his love for you, 
You can change whether he's pleased with you or not. And again, you don't want his displeasure on your life. It's not fun. I did it for a long time. It's not good. It's not a good place to be. All right? You'll be like that guy with Charlie Brown with the cloud over your head looking like Pink Pig. <laughs> when the Lord's not pleased with you, that's, that's how it is. Everything you touch is cursed. <laughs> Everything you say is wrong. Everywhere you go is off. Until you get it right with God. Until you get over into faith. And if I was having faith challenges, I'd check up on my love walk. Because that's the first place it seems to falter. Because perfect love casts out fear. So let's look at Job. <clears throat> I'm going to prove to you from the Word that Job's problem was fear and that God and the devil were not working on the same team. And that if it hadn't been for God, Job would have been annihilated. And the devil is just not that powerful. And so he's over here sacrificing in fear because he says, it may be that my sons have cursed God in their hearts. Where did such a thought come to the greatest man in the East? Well, be careful who you marry. Look at Job chapter 2 and verse 9. And can I ask a favor? Uh, can I get one of those drinks on the table back there or water or something? I'm, this is my 24th day this month preaching a two to three hour message. I feel like I'm on a telethon marathon up here. In Job chapter 2 verse 9, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Hmm. Well, now we know where Job got the thought that maybe his kids were cursing God in their hearts. You see? I'll, I'll take that word. Thank you. Be careful who you bed down with at night. That's why the scripture says, Bad company, 1 Corinthians 15 and 33, corrupts good morals. And he says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And he's not just talking about lost people. He's talking about unbelieving believers, too. Because their words in your ear are either producing faith or fear. They are. So, then you go over to chapter 3 and look at verse 25. And now, out of Job's own mouth, he's going to tell you the truth. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. Now, this is after he'd lost everything. So what God, it wasn't really even the devil. God had to tell the devil that what Job had was already in his hands. Just don't kill him. See, God can't lie. He probably didn't want to tell him that, but the devil was so blind, he didn't even know it. He says, all that he's got is in your possession. Why? Because he had succumbed to fear, and he had bedded down with the spirit of fear, and now the hedge was down, and the devil could just run ransacked through his life. But God, say that with me, but God, God. said, don't touch him. Don't kill him. See, God doesn't put sickness on people. God allows what you allow. That's where we go back to that Hebrew and the, the permissive tense versus the causative tense. God permits what you permit. If you permit an unequal yoke relationship in your life, guess what? God permits it. God is the perfect gentleman. He will protect your right to choose all the way to a burning hell. Even though he sent his son so that you never had to go there. You see? Now that's theology that works. Simple, easy theology. God's good and the devil is bad. You choose. They're not on the same team ever. You're just going to... I mean, if I can give one truth to you tonight. God is never evil. And never bringing evil to your life. But God <laughs> will protect your right to allow poverty, disease, depression, whatever. Because he gave you that free will. He doesn't want robots. He wants you to choose life. He wants you to choose the quickening power of his word. But if you won't, who will? He's not going to do it for you. The next time he gets up to do anything is to get on a horse and come get us. 
when he was hanging on the cross, he says, it's finished. And now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father where he ever lived to make intercession for you. Now in Hebrews, the Bible calls him the apostle and high priest of our profession. I mean, he could have said the apostle and high priest of our canoe. But of all the words he chose to be the apostle and high priest of, he said profession. And he's not talking about your job either. He's talking about the profession of your mouth. Jesus is praying over the words of your mouth to be in line with the word of the Bible. Just exactly like he did. Go to John chapter 14 and look at verses 10 through 12. Or, yeah, verses 10 through 12. As a side note, as we leave Job back in the back cooking hamburgers for us, in chapter 42, verse 5, Job says this after God answers him out of a whirlwind. He says, I have heard of, behold, <laughs> look, see, and proceed. I've heard of you with the hearing of my ears, but now I see you with my eyes. You see, he heard of God with his head. But until he got illumination from the Spirit of God, he didn't know him in his heart. And that's where a lot of us have been. You've heard all kind of religious verses spit out and all hermeneutical, pharmaceutical stuff, you know, from pastor disaster, you graduated from the cemetery, I mean the seminary, you know, but that's not the Bible, that don't make it so. You know what Jesus said to the preachers of his day in John 8, 44? Uh, you're of your father, the devil. <laughs> What did John say? You brood of vipers. Who warned you to repent? Religion is a nasty, mean spirit. It's the meanest spirit. And it comes as an angel of light. So, where did I tell you to go this last time? John, chapter 10. While you're in John, flip over to 1 Timothy 4. <laughs> And look at verse 1. Whatever you do, say this with me. Whatever I do, this is not one thing that I'm going to do. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. Don't do that. Don't depart from faith. I know it says the faith, but don't depart from faith. Anything that's not a faith is sin. We've been in a series of teachings here. And it started down to four to 15 days of faith. Luke 18 and 8 says, When I return, will I really find faith in the earth? Of all the questions that Jesus asked of our generation, we're the generation to see his return. He says, we were the generation to see the fig tree blossom again. He says, that generation will not pass away, but we'll see his coming. Well, Israel is the fig tree. In 1948, they became a nation again. They're the only nation in the history of the world to have been a nation, disbanded as a nation, and then become a nation again. In 1967, they recaptured Jerusalem from the Gentiles. So depending on when your clock started ticking in 48 or 67, the clock is ticking. And you're that generation. And I can't see how a generation is longer than 120 years. That's what he told Noah. I'm not going to strive with man forever. I mean, if it is, it is. I'm sure there's a way he's got it figured out. But if you go 48 plus 120, that's 2068. I mean, if you're going to get it done for the Lord, you better get done. Better get started tonight. My mama says, uh, make hay while the sun is shining. And then she says, most people miss opportunity because it comes knocking at the door wearing overalls and looks a lot like work. So if you're going to get busy for God, uh, start today. <laughs> yeah. But he says, of that generation, when I return, am I going to really find them persistent in faith? Now, in Hebrews 6, 1 through 3, don't turn there now, I'll quote it for you. He says, uh, there's six basic doctrines of the Bible, of your Christian faith. There's six. Number one is repentance from dead works. That's all your teachings on grace. By grace you're saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. Number two, of faith towards God. That's what we're talking about tonight. Number three, the doctrine of baptisms. It's plural. There's water baptism, Holy Ghost baptism, and then you're baptized into Christ when you get saved. Then there's the laying on of hands. We lay hands on people for healing. 
We lay hands on people to speak the Father's blessing over them, like Abraham and Isaac. We lay hands on people to ordain them for ministry. We lay hands on people to... Oh, no, that's uh, disciplining your kids there. My bad. Uh, we lay hands on people <laughs> to get filled with the Holy Ghost. You need to know these things. Eternal judgment and resurrection of the dead. We're going to start a series when I get back to Florida on the end times. We're going to call it 15 Days of Revelation. I can't call it 15 Days of Eternal Judgment. I don't think anybody would come. But that's what we're going to talk about. You need to know those six things. And of all six Bible, basic Bible doctrines, elementary school doctrines, are you smarter than a fifth grader? Elementary school. Of those six, the one that he asked the question about was faith. And not because he didn't know the answer to it. He asked that question because we needed to do a self-check. We needed to look in the mirror and go, am I really walking in faith? Not because I think I'm in faith, but because I line up with what the Bible calls faith. The Bible says we live and we move and we have our being in faith. The Bible says in Hebrews that these died in faith. Exodus 23 says, worship the Lord thy God. And he will bless your bread and your water, and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. The number of your days I will fulfill. So if you put those two verses together, your last day, that last number, whatever that is, is a well day. Not a sick day. There's no machines hooked up to you. So that's how you should die in faith. Just lean back in the chair and say, well, I'm out of here. <laughs> and go. That's, that's how you should go. That's how you go in faith. Now, I've got a gal that uh, lives in Louisville, Kentucky. Her name's Asia Ludlow. And she heard about Pastor Eric and praying for the sick. And she was already had a double mastectomy, had been diagnosed with cancer and all that, given just a short time to live. And she on, on the Friday before, her doctor scheduled surgery for her the next Friday to have fluid removed from her lungs. That's in addition to this cancer. And on Tuesday, she finally called to reach out for help on the telephone. And I got to spend 45 minutes on the phone with her. And in the context of the conversation, the Holy Spirit said, Eric, hers is not a need for a physical healing, though it looks like it. Hers is a demonic spirit of infirmity. Rebuke the spirit off of her in my name, and she'll get better. The cancer will leave. you got to know these things. And so I did it. And on Friday, she was going back into surgery. She had the IV in her arm, the gown on, and the doctor's wheeling her back in there. And he says, listen, uh, Asian, um, there's so much fluid in your lungs based on last Friday's x-ray that your lungs may collapse in surgery. And so I guess he was saying sorry, Nara. <laughs> okay. But he says, for some reason, I want to take one more x-ray before we operate. Well, you and I both know why that some reason was. Because we had prayed on Tuesday. And so he wheels her back in there to the x-ray machine, takes an x-ray, and says, Asia, come back here and look at this. And she says, Pastor Eric, they never show me my x-rays. And I think it's to keep what bit of sanity that I have still intact. But, but I went back there. And he said, Asia, all the cancer around your heart is completely gone. And there's no fluid in your lungs. We're not going to do surgery. You can go home. You're, you're well. We don't want to see you again until January. That's September. That's longer than they get to live. That's faith. That's healing. you got to know these things. I didn't do anything. I can make it worse. I don't like blood and needles and all that. I'm a winner when it comes to that stuff. But then I get in the anointing. And I eat giants for my lunch. I love that song. I heard that the other day. Anybody heard that song? Rick Pino. I eat giants. What's the name of that song? Uh, I eat giants. This is a good one. Anyway, go back to John. Don't depart from the faith. Don't depart from faith. Say, I won't, Pastor Eric. I won't, Pastor Eric. All right. John chapter 10, verse, or John chapter 14 and verse 10. This is Jesus talking, and he's going to give you his secret to ministry right here. He says, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words, pay attention to that word, words. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does 
the works. So what he's saying is, is the words of my Father in me that I speak are performing the works that you see. That's why he can say this next verse. In verse, uh, verse let's go to verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Why? Because it's a matter of just saying what Jesus said. And Jesus is the word. And so if you put the word in your mouth and the word in your heart, and you are careful to do all that it says, Joshua 1 and 8, then you will make your way successful and prosperous. So when you can say, like Jesus said, uh, the words of my Father in me, they do the works. Then you'll be doing the works that Jesus did. Can you say amen? amen. Last night I told these guys about Mr. Sniffles. Mr. Sniffles should be your new best friend. Those of you who are designed to win people to Jesus, you say, Pastor, who's Mr. Sniffles? Well, Mr. Sniffles is the guy in the cubicle next to you who all day long is going... Just walk over to his cubicle and say, Mr. Sniffles, can I speak a blessing over you? Okay. <laughs> in the name of Jesus, be healed. Mark 16 and 18. Believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's a sign that follows the preaching of the gospel. Jesus said in Isaiah 61 and 1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He, has, he says, I am anointed to heal. He went around telling people, I'm anointed to heal you. So that's why he said, in my name, they'll get better. Because in my name is my anointing. And where is Jesus living? Inside of you. Is it you doing the healing? No. But it's the name doing the healing. If you study the name. If you're not a chump. If you're a champ and you know what the word says about his name. Then you'll have that same power flowing through you. But if you never heard this stuff, if, if you're living a character contest of Christianity, well, I sin four times a day and I saw you sin five, so today the Lord loves me more. If that's you, you're missing the whole thing. Should you have character? Absolutely. Should you be a person of your word? Absolutely. Should you do good deeds, help the little ladies across the street? Absolutely. But the Bible says in John 14 and 12, the works that I do, you'll do, and even greater works. That means soul winning. That means walking on water or driving on water. <laughs> like we did the last time I was up here when it was frozen over. <laughs> I never saw Jesus get in a van and drive over the Jordan. But we got up here at Lake Oka something and drove over it. And yeah, anyway. Laughter makes the medicine go down, doesn't it? First Corinthians 14 and 3 says, The gift of prophecy edifies, exhorts, and comforts. And I believe the Holy Spirit has some, some words for people tonight. And I just want to speak words of encouragement. How's Crystal doing? That's pretty good, wasn't it? One of the other gifts of the Spirit, last we had this happen last night, was afterwards we were praying and they'd asked me to pray about a couple of things. And I said to the daughter, I said, if I said to you the name Crystal, would that mean anything to you? She says, that's my stepmom. Mm. See, that's a word of knowledge. That's given by the Holy Spirit. Guys, I used to be a heathen. I used to cuss people out. I used to just be just bad, just, just a bad person. And to sit here and be able to hear from the Lord anything is an absolute miracle. Mm. People on Facebook see that I got saved in a preaching. And they almost go into cardiac arrest. I have to have a healing service right there on the chat box. <laughs> and I have, I pray for people in South Africa to be born again. Never met them, but I pray with them. It's how you use these utilities that make them good or bad. In and of themselves, they're just nothing. Same thing with money. It's neither good nor bad. It's just a stupid piece. It's just a piece of paper. It's not even stupid. It don't, you know. When we played basketball, the coach used to say, if you miss a shot, it's just a stupid piece of leather. Don't know whether it went in last time or not. Don't worry about it. Shoot it again. But you've got money cut. You do. And 1 Peter 5, 7 is, is how you're going to be able to qualify for that. 
You've got to cast the whole of that care over on the Lord. For He cares for you affectionately. You've got money coming. I'm just telling you that right now. Maybe that was on your heart. Well, now it doesn't have to be. Now you're edified. You can stand up inside like a building being built, right? And it comforts you. All right. And it exhorts you not to worry, not to fret. You've had fear. You've been worried about some stuff. You've been anxious and nervous about some stuff. Maybe that's going to walk over here and blow your eardrums out. It's all right. Say that with me. It's all right. It's better than all right. And your friends are going to be all right, too. God's going to give you some good friends, better friends. And don't worry about fitting in. You and Jesus are a majority anywhere you go. So don't worry about stuff at school. Don't worry about these people that are just half-steppers. Don't worry about it. God's got more than enough. But you know, sometimes He does test us with good. He tests us to see if we really believe what we say we believe. Now you say you're a Christian. I can see that all over you. But He's testing. He's just, well, I wonder if she really believes that or not. Because see, right at your age is about the age that people either go this way or that way. And it's, it's, you're, it's more crucial the age you're at right now than the man behind you. And he's maybe twice your age. It's more crucial your age right now. It is. Statistically speaking, if you don't ask Jesus Christ into your heart by the time you turn 20, you have somewhere between a 4 and a 6% chance that you ever will. Now, I don't know who does these statistics, but even if they're off by 20%, it's still a huge percentage of people become Christians in their teenage 